It's a very great privilege for me to be here, and I want to thank the Madison program and Professor Raz. Uh, when, when Brad Wilson invited me, first mentioned this possibility to me. Uh, is Brad? Brad is not here yet, but um, is he here? Oh, there he is. There he is. Um, he, he made a pitch as if a pitch really needed to be made that, you know, that I should say yes and come. <laughs> he said, Tullivson, you're going to be, it's the heights. You'll be scaling the heights. Raz, Waldron, it's the heights, Tullivson. <laughs> I, said, I said, I'm not used to the heights. The air is thin up there. I might get sick. And Brad patted me on the shoulder. He said, we'll have medical personnel on hand. So. In this paper, I aim to say some things about inquiry and its ethics both for their own sake and in order to illustrate, elaborate upon, and occasionally question or criticize some of the main claims in Joseph Raz's book, The Morality of Freedom. The key concept of the paper is that of a social form. If it makes sense to say, as I shall, that inquiry is a social form, then inquiry becomes available as a way of life for some agents. Inquiry is available as a comprehensive goal. It is also likely that a culture in which inquiry exists is better off, and that inquiry is therefore a collective good. Finally, it is further likely that the life of an excellent inquirer will be structured by virtues the understanding of which is internal to that social form. In discussing inquiry on all these fronts, my further aim is to articulate some of the relationships between this family of concepts, social forms, comprehensive goals, collective goods, the virtues, and the concepts of autonomy, objectivity, and integrity, relationships to which Raz is attentive throughout the morality of freedom and elsewhere. There are two large or two, two main sections of the paper. So this is the, the first section, of which the first subheading is social forms. Personal comprehensive goals, which I'll talk about in the next section, are made possible by the, quote, public perception of common social forms of action, each of which has the internal richness and complexity which makes it into a possible comprehensive personal goal, end quote. Raz's account of social forms seems similar to me to McIntyre's notion of a practice. For both, a socially established and cooperative form of life makes possible the pursuit of a good or goods in a unique way, a way that's fully intelligible only to those who have, by habituation and the achievement of certain excellences, entered into the social form in question. Moreover, for both, it would seem that a condition of adequacy for a social form or a practice is the possibility of both a division of labor and of progress. The internal richness and complexity of which Raz speaks would be jeopardized by work that was identical for all agents, either at, a, at the same time, right, where everybody is doing the same thing, or for a culture throughout time where the practice doesn't change at all. Pumping gas would not, I take it, be a social form because there's essentially only one way to do it, and that way does not and will not change much over time. There's little opportunity for the individual pumper of gas to progress in excellence or for the practice itself to develop in ways that, say, the social form of medicine has progressed, and pumping gas is a largely non-cooperative activity. A further point about social forms, as the anticipatory reference to comprehensive goals makes clear, it's within a social form and the activities and ways of life made possible by that social form that an individual becomes better off, or in Raz's language, that his well-being increases. But the sociality of a social form provides a bridge between the good pursued by the individual agent and the good of society, the common or public good. What could account for the existence of a form of behavior as a social form except that that form of behavior, as evolved, was socially valuable and socially valued. Thus, quote, the source of value is one for the individual and the community, end quote. Inquiry is a social form. Now, inquiry, by which I mean the systematic pursuit of significant truth in some domain for its own sake, should be considered a social form. In particular, the forms of inquiry specified over time within our common culture are social forms, of which two very broadly are of special interest, scientific inquiry and humanistic inquiry. These could be further specified as inquiry within the biological sciences or the chemical sciences or physics on the one hand and historical, philosophical, or literary inquiry on the other. In each case, there is a socially established and cooperative form of activity, social both as to its practice and as to its goods, characterized by progress in the pursuit of a good internal to that activity, an activity internally rich and complex, and benefited in all these respects by the presence of certain virtues or excellences in the participants in these social forms or in inquiry. In this section, I'm particularly concerned with the social nature of the practice of inquiry, and in the next, with the role of inquiry in an individual's life, and in the third, with the social goods of inquiry. Now, scientific inquiry is manifestly social. First, science is social as to its practice, that is, as to its method and the culture within which science is, as it were, lived. 
Scientists work together to design and carry out experiments, promulgate the results of their research, and rely upon the work of others to test their findings and to pick up where they left off in the advancement of understanding. Such cooperation is not accidental to the activity. It is now constitutive of the activity of science that the scientific aspirant participate in the social network within which scientists rely on the work of others who have preceded them and participate in and allow themselves to be judged by the tribunal of scientists as regards new work. The experimental method itself is public in important ways beyond this need for promulgation and criticism. For these aspects of science's public nature are made possible by the initial publicity of the scientific method, the experimental method. An experiment is a public putting to the test of a hypothesis itself made publicly. The power of science in generating knowledge depends in part upon its special ability to make its ideas public via experiment. The experiment gives a publicly recognized meaning to the ideas and public assessment in a public space of their validity. Science is public in a second way because it both expresses the nature and values of the broader culture within which it exists and shapes that culture. A scientific culture expresses a commitment to the value of theoretical knowledge of nature, perhaps to a mastery of nature. Such a commitment is far from inevitable. A culture might so spiritually understand nature that it deemed it sacrilege to investigate it empirically. A culture might regard science as insufficiently sensitive to the needs of authority. Or it might reject science as associated with a set of related values towards which the culture was antagonistic. By its choice of projects, its orientation of interest, and its self-imposed restrictions, a science defines a culture. A scientific ethos that moves towards an increasingly utilitarian or technological focus and away from knowledge of nature for its own sake defines a culture in one way. A science willing to make use of the ill, the old, the young, or the disadvantaged for the sake of gain in knowledge defines its culture in another way. Humanistic inquiry might seem different from science in a number of ways. It conspicuously lacks the ability to make public both its meanings and its truth in ways that can generate the consensus of science. Still, philosophic inquiry, to take one example, is both cooperative and socially established. Right from the beginning, the Socratic method's use of dialectic, which is taken over in different forms by Plato and Aristotle, makes clear that philosophy is different from, say, a purely meditative and isolated path to wisdom. Philosophy today is deeply tied to its history, both for an understanding of its own nature and problems, and for the sake of continuing reflection on the nature of philosophic method. And the social world of philosophy is characterized by an extraordinary amount, somebody, may, somebody might argue too much, but certainly an extraordinary amount of publication. In principle, the attempt to articulate one's claims and subject them to the tribunal of the discipline. And, as I'll, show, I, I'll address in a later section, philosophy and the humanities are expressive of and definitive of a culture in a way analogous to science. Inquiry as a comprehensive goal. The morality of freedom articulates a formal theory of value. That is, it does not fill in the theory with a full account of what values there are, although it discusses some. But Raz provides an account of human well-being that ties well-being to an agent's successful pursuit of goals, and those goals are justified by where those goals are justified by reasons. Raz distinguishes helpfully these notions from notions of self-interest and biologically determined needs and desires. Well-being is not unrelated to self-interest. Fulfillment of biological needs is typically a precondition for the capacity to pursue well-being. But our goals present themselves to us as objects for evaluation, and our willingness to adopt and maintain our goals is dependent on a positive judgment of their worth. Amongst our goals are those that Raz describes as comprehensive, and our well-being is, accordingly, more deeply tied up with such goals. Raz writes, quote, other things being equal, if a goal permeates all aspects of one's life, it and actions serving it are more important than if it affects only a short span of one's life or only a few aspects of it, end quote. But Raz continues, this, quote, is not a recommendation to embrace pervasive or life-encompassing goals. Some people do. Others are seized with horror at the thought. I know of no reason to prefer one tendency against the other, end quote. But I think that there are such reasons. Why should we think that a commitment to some pervasive, comprehensive goal or goals is essential to well-being rather than just one way of pursuing well-being among others? The answer lies in value pluralism itself. Human beings are faced with a multiplicity of goods, frequently specified as social forms and general ways of life from which they must choose. These various goods and ways of life are, as Raz stresses, mutually incompatible in the sense that they cannot be jointly pursued successfully and incommensurable in that each gives reasons, irreducible to the reasons given by the others, for action on their behalf. Further, the more significant social forms have internal to them a set of normative demands they make on their practitioners and a conception of how normatively those demands are to rank relative to the norms, to other norms and opportunities that might be faced by an agent. 
It's not, for example, available to a doctor to simply drive by an unattended accident in order to pursue her commitment to playing the Tuesday night softball game. Adequate pursuit of many social forms thus can only be achieved by focus and more or less exclusive commitment. To become an adequate carpenter, doctor, or musician, one must devote a part of one's life to that activity so as to be able to achieve in time the excellences necessary for success in that domain. But because of the limits of time and ability and the inevitability of conflict, given the internal demands of each social form, it's unreasonable for an agent to make too many such commitments or to make commitments with no thought as to how they may be jointly pursued. Harmony of commitments is necessary. This harmony is only achievable, however, in a way consistent with excellence and success in some social form by hierarchy. Some commitments must be such as themselves to play a structuring role in ordering other commitments in their appropriate places. And not all social forms are capable of playing this structuring role. Some are pursued primarily for the sake of instrumentality such as money. Some activities are insufficiently open-ended to be sustainable through a life, such as the commitment to a completable goal. But some practices or social forms are precisely capable of sustaining a comprehensive commitment and structuring the pursuit of other less comprehensive goals within an agent's life. These social forms typically wear their architectonic nature on their sleeves in the form of internal normative priorities they demand with respect to other social forms and practices. And marriage is a paradigm of such a social form. Commitment to such a comprehensive goal is, as Raz argues, constitutive of an agent's character and thus of what integrity is for an agent, for that agent, Integrity re requires a continuous alignment of the agent's will in accordance with the values of the social form to which she's committed. Inquiry seems, like medicine or marriage, to be capable of playing such a structuring role in an agent's life. That is, it is a suitable, comprehensive goal for an agent, although not a mandatory goal. Inquiry is difficult, requiring skills that cannot be obtained all at once, and inquiry into a worthwhile subject will not be quick or easy. So inquiry will be successfully pursued only over a long and sustained period of time. Inquiry further demands a range of virtues rather than just a narrow skill set. Such virtues can only be possessed if they pervade an agent's character. Susan Hack remind, re remarks that she would find it odd to hear of someone described as a good man but intellectually dishonest. And I think it would be similarly problematic to say of somebody that who's a brilliant scientist but otherwise dishonest. The commitment to truth characteristic of taking inquiry as a comprehensive goal should be seen globally across an agent's character. Two further points may be made about the way in which inquiry is available as a comprehensive goal. First, inquiry can play the kind of overarching structuring role capable, characteristic of major architectonic commitments. Agents can see their lives as dedicated to inquiry and other activities as subordinated to inquiry. Agents committed to inquiry will make certain sacrifices with respect to other goods, spending less time exercising or learning to play the piano, for example, although inquiry may also be itself subsumed under other more architectonic commitments such as marriage. Second, particular obligations can flow from this commitment to inquiry. Consider the obligation that committed inquirers may have to, or might have to reasons opposed to what they take to be the truth. Such reasons support the belief that not P, even though the inquirer believes that P is true. Perhaps those committed to inquiry as a life-structuring comprehensive goal have a special obligation to such defeated con considerations, an obligation to give them further consideration, to demonstrate the ways in which they're epistemically inadequate, and so on. Or perhaps a heightened skepticism is a particular obligation of a professional inquirer. And the, the particular virtues of inquiry, such as honesty, intellectual courage, intellectual justice, studiositas, or Aquinas's studiousness, might make in particular situations, these, all these virtues might make in particular situations very particular demands on agents. Such considerations suggest ways in which inquiry, like medicine, can form a focal point of an agent's life-structuring commitments. Now, I want to flag here a uh, developing worry. Inquiry as a comprehensive goal requires a commitment to the good of truth. I take this to be a practice transcendent good. The good of truth or knowledge of the truth is intelligible and can give point to our actions outside the social form of inquiry and across a variety of different social forms which specify the pursuit of truth. What is the relationship between practice transcendent goods or reasons and the socially dependent forms of action in life within which those goods can be pursued? Are the latter necessary, as Raz argues, for the former? I'll return to this question in the second part of the paper. Inquiry as a social good. <clears throat> First, however, I wish to say something about the social goods and benefits of inquiry. It is relatively easy to show that scientific inquiry is both a public and a collective good, somewhat more difficult to show this of humanistic inquiry. But I make the case for each in order to say something about the relationship between collective goods, well-being, and autonomy. Science systematically inquires into and teaches us about the world in which we live. 
This understanding is valuable in itself, both for individual inquirers and for society. Soviet society was made, off, was made worse off just by the deficiencies of its scientific understanding, even apart from any deficiencies in uh, any failures of instrumental agency that those deficiencies may have resulted in. People are better off living in a society that's scientifically learned rather than scientifically ignorant. Science is also obviously instrumentally valuable. Much of the modern world is built on a technological foundation laid, down, laid by modern science. And the benefits for which science is instrumental are, like the benefits of a scientifically learned culture, generally so widespread that it's impossible to be denied them or even to deny them to oneself, save by banishment from or rejection of the society. One of the ways in which a, scientifically, a scientific culture is socially valuable, a way of considerable importance to Raz, is that it's only within a scientific culture that agents can choose to become scientists. The existence of a scientific culture is thus a great gain for what Raz calls the ideal of autonomy, an ideal according to which what agents desire is to be part authors of their lives. It is commitment to this ideal that characterizes liberalism, including the liberalism defended in the morality of freedom. Humanistic inquiry might seem initially quite different from science, for such inquiry resolves itself less frequently into consensus than does scientific inquiry. There is thus less, less justification for speaking of a public body of humanistic knowledge of intrinsic benefit to society. This asymmetry, excuse me, this asymmetry is grounded in two further prima facie asymmetries that regard the public nature of science. One reason that humanistic inquiry tends less toward agreed truth is that such inquiry does not have the very public experimental method of science. And an apparent consequence of this is that the humanities might seem to be less expressive and constitutive of a culture than the sciences. I think we can see these asymmetries as either illusory or unimportant if we address humanistic inquiry as a body, rather than by, one by one, philosophic inquiry, literary inquiry, humanist, or historical inquiry, and so on. The starting point is a recognition that humanistic inquiry is governed by the sorts of normative concerns that are alien to science. Science can show us that this or that form of technology is possible, but it cannot show that it's moral. A scientist can tell us many things about the properties of ink and paper, but she can say nothing about the nature or value of literature. Again, the natural sciences can be invaluable in dating objects, but they cannot identify what historical events and persons are important for historical study. Science says nothing about the good, the right, the beautiful, the reasonable, the important, or the valuable. These are the concerns of the humanities, which are normative and not scientific. The connection to the normative explains why humanistic inquiry is bound to be different as regards the possibility of consensus. Even if there are truths in the humanities, they are not truths independent of us, to be gained by a detached, detached assessment from a, of a freestanding world, but rather they're truths involving us, to the assessment of which will bring desires, fears, hopes, prejudices, and so on. The normative is additionally in many ways deeply abstract, it can't be empirically checked, and it's filtered differently through different cultures in ways that facts about digestion, for example, aren't. So there will be widespread disagreement over not only answers to normative questions, but over method, since our paradigm of successful method is inapplicable. Still, consider how a culture determines itself when it decides that normative questions are of no importance to scientific inquiry. Such a culture has no room for the normative, only for what is natural. For such a culture, as C.S. Lewis suggested, Quote, man's conquest of nature turns out in the moment of its consummation to be nature's conquest of man, end quote. Without the realm of the normative, we are subject to the givenness of our biological condition. It's partly for this reason that the humanities are liberal. Their aim is to free persons from the sheerly descriptive constraints of nature. By contrast, considering a culture that understands, appreciates, and pursues the value of humanistic inquiry uh, in the way that I've just sketched out, allows us to rethink the alleged asymmetries between science and the humanities. For example, a culture that recognizes the importance of humanistic inquiry does thereby express and constitute itself as a society of a particular sort. Moreover, there would, in such a society, be convergence in the humanities on at least one crucial issue of humanistic importance, namely the importance of humanistic inquiry. And a crucial methodological disagreement would have been broadly resolved for agreement that the telos of the humanities was different from the telos of science should generate further, or, uh, re should rather further generate a recognition that method in the humanities was not and need not to approximate that of scientific method, and that failure so to approximate should not be seen as damning for humanistic inquiry's claims to truth. If these claims, or something like them, are defensible, then the further Razian claims about the importance of social forms stand where humanistic inquiry is concerned, as they do for scientific inquiry. For example, a culture in which inquiry is appreciated and cultivated is one in which individual autonomy is furthered because individuals have new options for choices of lives. 
No one can choose to be a philosopher, an historian, or a political theorist except in a culture where such social forms exist. And such social forms make available valuable lives which it is worthwhile for some agents to choose as definitive of the shape of large parts of their lives. Such reflections, I think, could lead in various Rousean directions. For example, Rouse holds that some rights are justified because in furthering an individual's interests, they thereby foster or promote a kind of culture that's a collective good. So the story told so far about both the sciences and the humanities would generate a particular account of the nature of the right to academic freedom and its relation specifically to a culture of inquiry. In the remainder of this section, however, I'll briefly discuss the relationship between a collective good such as inquiry and the ideal of autonomy. And then in the second, larger se second main section of the paper, I'll look at the question of objectivity. Much of what Raz says about the nature and value of autonomy seems exactly right to me. What I wish to do, however, is to identify a precise point at which the account seems to me to go astray, a point critical to Raz's identification of the nature of liberalism. It's not too difficult to imagine a culture in which some form of inquiry is considered important, yet which differs from ours along the axis of autonomy. In such a culture, persons are chosen by the state to pursue, say, scientific inquiry based on the state's assessment of their suitability. Moreover, the state divides the labor of inquiry among the people it has so chosen. And third, it sets a schedule for inquirers that determines what they will do and when, a schedule that's extensive in detail and scope. Now, by our lights, things will go much better if those decisions are left to individuals. First, it's true that for inquiry to prosper, some must be dedicated to it as a comprehensive goal. But an individual is in a better position to make that judgment uh, that he should pursue a life of inquiry than is the state. And it's necessary for the individual to make such a judgment and the corresponding commitment if inquiry is to be definitive for that individual's character and hence personal integrity. Second, the demand for a division of labor and the various implications of that demand, many of which are demands of justice, are internal to an understanding of the nature of inquiry as social and an appreciation of its richness and complexity. Agents who are given the space to choose their position in the nexus of inquiry and to recognize their roles, responsibilities, and accomplishments of others within that nexus are thereby given an opportunity to appreciate and participate more fully in the goods of inquiry. Finally, Insofar as inquiry is a comprehensive goal, it is architectonic in an agent's life, and it might or it might not be the most architectonic commitment. As such, the commitment to inquiry will shape an agent's localized deliberations and will generate particularistic obligations. It will rule out certain, objects or certain options as incompatible with the life of inquiry and will require negotiation between its own status and that of possibly more architectonic commitments and also less architectonic commitments. This fine-grained work of deliberation can really only be done well by the agent who has made the commitment and understands its scope, its relationship to other commitments, and its relationship to the variety of unique circumstances within which the agent finds herself. It is only the agent who right now can know whether the commitment to work on his RAS paper, for example, can, must, or need not take precedence over his, desires to, his daughter's desire to go to the park and his chair's desire to talk about next year's job searches. Uh, the daughter's desire to go to the park was actually that may have won in the end in that particular case. Recognition of these truths is a recognition of the value of autonomy, but it is at the same time a development in our appreciation of the form of life in question, in this case, the life of inquiry. Here we need to steer between saying that inquiry, we, that's me, right? This is the, this is the way that I want to steer at any rate. We need to steer between saying that inquiry with autonomy is the same as inquiry without it, but with autonomy added, and saying that inquiry with autonomy is different from inquiry without it but that the two are incommensurably good. Both are false for this reason, that inquiry with autonomy is, like marriage with autonomy, medicine with autonomy, the priesthood with autonomy, and indeed, I would claim, any worthwhile form of life with autonomy, a fuller realization of that way of life than it would be without autonomy. The integration of autonomy into a way of life constitutes a gain in that way of life's capacity to be part of an agent's well-being, flourishing, and success. Now, Raz will go so far and only so far with these claims, I think, for he accepts the inseparability thesis, the claim that autonomy is a, quote, central aspect in the character, end quote, of our society's social forms. But Raz says, quote, the inseparability of autonomy does not mean that it is not a distinct ideal, end quote. It is a dedication to this particular ideal that is supposed to characterize liberalism. And at the same time, Raz is willing, although there are tensions here, to accept that the non-autonomous pursuit of social forms in a different type of culture could be adequate for well-being. This discussion came up earlier today as well. 
This willingness seems to contribute to the distinctness of the ideal of autonomy by making it possible that some other ideal of social forms without autonomy could be incommensurably valuable and thus under other conditions worth pursuing. And in light of such claims, consider the following, quote, the provision of many collective goods is constitutive of the very possibility of autonomy, end quote. It's tempting to interpret this from the standpoint of liberalism as suggesting that a variety of forms of life should be encouraged for the sake of autonomy in order to make that ideal possible. But it seems more accurate to say the opposite. Autonomy is worth promoting or is worth protecting because acting autonomously is partly constitutive of the possibility of flourishing, of success in pursuing one or some of the variety of social forms properly understood. It's true that, thinly, having many social forms give ag gives agents a variety of choices, but it's more important from the standpoint of perfectionism that being autonomous gives agents a real opportunity to participate in worthwhile social forms. The conclusion of this line of thought is that an appreciation of autonomy is intrinsic to perfectionism just as such, and that adding liberal to the mix, as in liberal perfectionism, just muddies the waters. According autonomy, the status of a separate ideal and creating an ism, liberalism, that's dedicated to that, I think, is a mistake. Part two, which is briefer than part one, objectivity and the goods of inquiry. Now, all this is cursory and brief, but it introduces a cluster of issues prominent in the morality of freedom and elsewhere in Raz's work. If, say, philosophical inquiry or any other social form is a highly particularized and historically specified form of activity, the goods of which can best be appreciated only from within activities of that social form, have we abandoned objectivity for relativism? Raz's discussion of this problem is complex and ranges over a number of essays, and I can't hope to do it justice. But what seems to me the most significantly guiding thought in Raz's account is this. Were we to understand the existence of particular valuable social forms and the goods achievable locally in those social forms as the complete story of the objectivity of value, we would be conceding a deep lack of intelligibility to value in the world across cultures and across times. This thought is articulated by Raz in a number of ways. Consider first the possibility of recognition of an alien social form as valuable. This recognition is only possible against some kind of shared background. Raz writes, quote, granted that we cannot have a thick understanding of the concept of Javanese humor without familiarity, still we cannot recognize their humor for what it is unless we can subsume it under a more general concept and recognize theirs as an instance of humor. Similarly, Raz believes that intelligible change in moral principles, that is, change that can be understood, requires reference to a backdrop of unchanging principle. These claims and the arguments that underwrite them seem to be correct. Consider a problem faced by an overly internalist account of the value of a practice, as McIntyre sometimes appears to be, if, as McIntyre suggests, the goods of a practice can only be appreciated by those already within the practice and enabled by their excellences to have that appreciation, then the desire of those outside of a practice, whether a practice within one's culture or within a different culture, must be fundamentally irrational. If it is only from within marriage that one can understand marriage as goods, why would one wish to get married? Yet Raz's account of the broader values which give practices and social forms their intelligibility seems to me at the end of the day just a bit too thin. This is in part a result of his antipathy to Platonism, the view that the goods of practice have some independent existence just waiting to be instantiated in a practice like chess or philosophy. And the thinness is present in his unwillingness, as it seems to me, to say much more about the nature of what he calls basic primary goods than that they are just abstract conditions of intelligibility and in particular a tendency to de-ontologize his concept of such intelligibility-making goods. There are two pictures, Raz writes, that get us far, away, far enough away from the unintelligibility of localism and conventionalism. One, quote, of morality is resting on eternal verities, and one which sees it as perpetually evolving towards more general principles, end quote. Raz prefers the latter picture. I prefer the former. In the next few sections, I want, again using inquiry as a backdrop, to present a somewhat more robust picture of the basic primary values that give intelligibility to our pursuits, commitments, practices, and social forms. The picture will involve three stages, an account of three features of the basic primary goods that render them intelligibility-making, an account of the relationship between these goods and human nature, and an account of why social forms and practices are necessary even within a more robust framework of general values. Anything that could count as a basic primary good capable of providing intelligible reasons across a variety of actions, commitments, practices, and ways of life could not possibly be a state of affairs. Rather, such goods, among which I would include life, knowledge, aesthetic experience, friendship, and some others, 
are essentially open-ended possibilities for action, which cannot be exhausted by the pursuit of any or all agents. The goods, we could say, have both breadth and depth, and may not any of them come to completion in an agent or all agent's lifetimes. Consider goods such as knowledge, which underwrites the activities of inquiry. The image of breath helps us to recognize that this good is not to be pursued in one privileged way. Neither scientists nor philosophers, for example, have the only or the superior mode of pursuit of this good. Rather, every agent may potentially pursue this complex good in more than one way, and in ways which differ from every other agent. Even within the field of philosophy, there are an overwhelming number of ways of engaging in the practice, specific forms of service to this particular good. But beyond the practice of philosophy, the good of knowledge is pursued whenever an agent pursues a question out of curiosity, criticizes a previously accepted assumption, or even reads a newspaper, most newspapers. It's pursued in the large variety of other forms of inquiry. And it's pursued not only in the practices of inquiry, as they've developed in the West, but in earlier cultures in the activity of speculative mythologizing, and in some Eastern and Western subcultures in meditative practices and mysticism. The breadth of the goods is a correlate of their status as impersonal and intelligible. They're not agent relative, they're not particulars, as for example the objects of sensible inclinations considered as motivating are. When an agent sensibly desires some state of affairs, the state of affairs considered precisely as such is a reason or a quasi-reason only for the agent with that particular desire. But basic goods are intelligibly good for all agents and provide the same basic reasons for action for all agents. Goods also have depth. And this too is related to the denial that goods are essentially states of affairs. Dewey thought that all final ends were final in the sense of being completable, but this is false. The goods of life and health or knowledge or friendship are never completed. They always remain, there always remain new possibilities for pursuit of these goods, many of which are only made available to agents by their already having pursued these goods to some extent or other. This incompletability underwrites the possibility of excellence and creativity in the pursuit of goods, both in an individual's life and across the lives of generations. The biological sciences today are vastly more advanced than they were 200 or 2,000 years ago. But they're neither finished nor are they finishable. When a tradition of inquiry flourishes, the advances of previous generations are built on the current generation, which will be sure to provide resources for future generations so that the progress may continue. Similarly, in an individual's life, a successful pursuit of knowledge is one which opens up new possibilities previously unseen and allows the agent to develop new insights previously unimagined. By contrast, if basic goods were states of affairs, then as Dewey indicates, virtues would be narrowly, te narrowly technical skills and the meaningfulness of pursuit of goods would be threatened precisely by the possibility of completion of the pursuit. For having accomplished a good, an agent would be left with nothing further to do. And if, on the other hand, the agent did not accomplish the good, then pursuit would have been meaningless because it would have failed to achieve its end. Basic goods, by contrast, are achieved in their pursuit, which pursuit, if done well, always opens up a new horizon of pursuit rather than bringing us closer to a shutting door. A little mixing of metaphors there. Now, these three features of the basic primary goods, the goods which give reasons for action that make intelligible the variety of practices and social forms, actions, commitments, and ways of life, suggest that the goods are not primarily a product of abstraction or the attempt at a comprehensive understanding of practical realities that are already to some degree intelligible to us, but that they're rather ontological preconditions of, act of action rooted in the nature of human beings. The goods, that is, seem best described as expressing the limited range of human potentialities. Limited, that is, in the sense that they are the potentialities of human as opposed to canine or feline nature. But these potentialities are unlimited in the senses described above. They open up a manifold of ways for human potentialities to be developed and a continuing and uncompletable opportunity for that development. And to say this, I take it, is to attempt to nudge Raz and any other perfectionist thinker in the room in the direction of a natural law view. What I want to suggest is that this picture of the basic primary goods, a picture that is slightly more ontologically rich than Raz's picture, and more in keeping with the timeless verities image than with the evolution towards general principles picture, is still friendly to the deep importance of social forms. The basic primary goods can be pursued in a potentially infinite, degree, infinite variety of ways, and in at least some of those ways they can be pursued to increasing degrees of depth. But just as no individual can successfully pursue any good to a significant degree of depth if she does not focus, not just on a good, but on a particular path to the good, so successions of agents through time cannot explore the depths of excellence in the pursuit of goods if they do not capitalize on the pursuits of those who have gone before them. This requires that, in some areas of the pursuit of basic primary goods, the particular mode of pursuit become progressively more specified 
as being of this rather than that aspect of the good, as being in this rather than that mode of pursuit, as using these rather than those resources, techniques, skills, and so on. But this, in fact, is simply to say that the pursuit of basic goods across generations, if it is to be progressive, must specify itself into a series of practices or social forms in which the wisdoms, techniques, and foci of past generations are made more determinate in a variety of ways. A social form, then, is a result of such a historically determining and specifying pursuit of some basic primary good or goods, as Raz argues mixing of goods is very important here, the practices of writing sonnets, painting portraits, doctoring, lawyering, doing analytic philosophy of law or biological research are all consolidations of past advances in the pursuit of goods, consolidations which increased the potential depth to which the goods may be pursued, but through the development of conventions, techniques, and skills, narrowed the breadth of ways within which the goods may be pursued consistent with membership in the practice. This does not mean that agents engaged in a social form are rigorously bound to the conventions and rules already established, a social form would be in decline if agents were to see rote conformity as their only available form of life within the social form. But a social form does specify the mode of pursuit of a good in a way that can only develop across a more or less significant amount of time. No social form, least of, those, least of all those of inquiry, humanistic or scientific, could have sprung up whole all at once. Agents therefore require as participants in social forms some sense of the past of that social form. McIntyre writes of a tradition that it's a continuing argument through time, and the same seems true of social forms. They're continuing arguments about how to shape in a number of particular ways the pursuit of some facet of the basic primary goods. Agents with little sense of why the social form they inhabit is as it is will tend to see its particularities as arbitrary. Agents who reject altogether the contingent starting point of a social form at a time will miss out on the accumulated resources of their ancestors. The folly of either mistake in scientific or humanistic inquiry should be clear. The upshot is, I think, a small but important correction of a claim that Raz makes in his essay, Moral Change and Social Relativism. Morality, Raz writes, quote, may be essentially temporal, end quote. I think it would be more accurate to say that human persons are essentially temporal. Commitments, hierarchies, practices, and the particularities of our social forms and communities result from the interaction of an essentially temporal and hence deeply, of essentially temporal and hence deeply limited particular human beings with a timeless morality that is a reflection of an unchanging human nature of nearly endless potential. Thank you. very honored to be here and to be part of this event. Um, Tamsin has brought down my handout, which is going around. Um, I want to start by saying that it's been a great pleasure to think about Chris's rich essay um, in anticipation of today's event. And there are many interesting issues raised in the essay. I'm only going to talk about a few of them. OK. Um, Chris begins by making two claims. The first um, is the claim of Raz's, and Chris embraces it. The second um, is a claim of Chris's. The first claim is that a person's well-being is improved by having a project that involves pursuing a goal. That seems right to me, too. Um, the second claim, and, and some, and, is, which is in the starting point for the paper, is this claim that one such project that can make your life better to pursue is the project of inquiry. This also seems true. Chris goes on to make some more specific claims about how the different projects in a person's life should fit together. And he quotes Raz as saying, and this is on the handout, um, other things being equal, if a goal permeates all aspects of one's life, it and actions serving it are more important if it affects a short, um, if it affects a short span of one, are more important than, not that, than if it affects a short span of one's life or only a few aspects of it. But this is not a recommendation to embrace 
pervasive or life-encompassing goals. Some people do. Others are seized with horror at the thought. I know of no reason to prefer one tendency against the other. So says Roz. Chris says, well, actually, there are reasons to pursue such goals. And I want to start by asking what claim Chris is making here. And um, I can see two different claims that Chris might be making. One is quite strong, and this is claim three on the handout. Chris might be saying that a life goes better if it is structured around one central project, and thus around one goal, with this central project getting absolute priority over any other project. Um, some of what Chris says suggests to me that he has this claim in mind, but perhaps Chris is making the weaker claim, claim four, that a life goes better if it involves a project that permeates many aspects of the life. Um, and claim four would be compatible with um, such projects, um, sometimes, only sometimes taking precedence over other projects and other projects sometimes taking precedence over those projects. Now, Chris points out that there are some meaningful pro projects that require a great deal of commitment. So being a doctor or a musician are projects um, that are not compatible with too many other projects like that. Um, now, so far, this might just be an endorsement of claim four on the handout. Um, um, you know, some projects require a, lot, a great deal of commitment, and those projects can be great for you. But then Chris um, goes on. He makes a number of claims, and these are on the handout. He says, look, value pluralism holds its true. There are indeed various goods that are incompatible and incommensurable. He also says, um, given that one might have a variety of projects that involve, that involve these incommensurable goods, you've still got to achieve some harmony among the various goals that you have, um, and you've got to achieve that harmony if you're going to pursue significant projects like being a doctor. Um, and then he says, and this is what I take to be the striking claim, that this harmony is only achievable by hierarchy. Um, now, it's there that I really, um, at that point in the paper, that I really thought, well, Chris may be arguing for claim three, that, that we really, that um, you should have one central project, or anyway, a life can go better with one central project to which all other projects are prioritized, below which all other projects are prioritized. And if the argument is supposed to go via the claims that I've offered on the handout, I think it's not a good argument. Um, it reminds me of an argument that I once heard when I was flipping channels on my television, and there was a television preacher on. And he said, in a family, decisions have got to be made. Now, if there are two heads of the family, say the husband and the wife, then there will just not be any way of decisions being made. There won't be any way to make decisions because the two may sometimes disagree. So there has to be a head of the family. The TV preacher was arguing in favor of patriarchy. It's not a good argument. It's not a good argument because there are lots of ways to make decisions. Even when two people disagree, there are lots of ways of proceeding from the fact of disagreement. Um, now, similarly, I, I think Chris might be saying or Chris seemed to me to be saying in the paper that um, we're just going to have no way of balancing our commitments to competing projects unless we adopt the rule that this project wins out every time. But that's not true. There are lots of other ways that we could balance commitments to competing projects. We could, for example, adopt the principle that I offer on the handout. I will balance my commitments to projects A and B. Sometimes I will allow A to win out, sometimes B, in ways that will allow both projects to thrive. That seems like a way of remaining quite committed to both projects while not giving either one absolute priority. Now, I really might be misleading Chris in suggesting that he's advocating claim three. Um, he might just be advocating a weaker claim, not just claim four, but he might be advocating the claim that some hierarchy among your projects is valuable. It's valuable to have some projects prioritized over others, though it may be that some projects get equal status in the hierarchy. And some of what he says suggests that that's really what he has in mind. 
Um, when I did think that Chris was advocating claim three, and I, I remain agnostic on the point of whether Chris is advocating claim three, though I think we'll learn shortly. Um, I at first thought that Chris might, you know, so it's good to have one project that everything else is prioritized below, and that project should be in inquiry. And that seemed a really unattractive view to me. Um, and even Chris does say at one point, quote, agents can see their lives as dedicated to inquiry. Um, there's a strong reading of that where, um, where it's the claim three version. Um, this just doesn't seem like a recipe for a good life to me. Um, it makes me think of those academics who are so driven that they utterly neglect their families or they neglect to have families. Um, it seems to me that these people haven't really figured out how to live. Um, maybe that's too strong a claim. Um, maybe I should just make the weaker claim that at least that's not the only good life possible. That's not a better life than people who try to incorporate families. But other things that Chris says suggest that if he's advocating a life at which one project is prioritized beyond all others, he doesn't necessarily mean it should be the project of inquiry. It might be, for example, the project of a marriage. And that actually seems much more plausible to me that um, someone might be committed to their marriage beyond everything else. That, that's the primary commitment. And um, that might make one's life better. But I think that that is a bit of a cheat. Because I think it's part of our conception of a successful marriage that it involves balancing other aspects of your life. Um, all right. Now I'm going to turn to talking about some other things that Chris says and turn to the other side of the handout. Chris goes on to talk about the way that the project of inquiry is a social good. The fruits of inquiry are good for society, and the availability of inquiry as a life project is good because it's good that different life projects be available. Now, in this section of the paper, Chris makes some provocative claims about the difference between the sciences and the humanities. For example, he says that the sciences tend more toward consensus than the humanities, and he attributes this to two factors. First, science relies on experiments. And second, truths in the humanities, quote, are truths involving us and to the assessment of which we bring desires, fears, hopes, and prejudices. Well, this is a big topic that Chris touches on only briefly. But it does strike me that the picture he paints is a little too simple. So science is far from devoid of disagreement. Um, just for two examples, evolutionary biologists often argue about whether a particular feature is adapted or merely an evolutionary spandrel. Also, um, another example, physicists argue about the correct interpretation of quantum physics. I, there, there are lots of live debates in the sciences, um, and some somewhat intractable, I mean, I think intractable is the wrong word, but some you know, that seem like they, they may last for a long time as debates. But also, there are many scientific questions which do seem to be about us and the meaning of our lives, or at least they seem that way to some people. Um, consider, for two examples, how people once felt about just the basic facts of the solar system, what it meant to people to learn that the Earth orbits the sun, and then think about how some people today still feel about evolution. Okay, turning to another thing that Chris says. Chris um, argues that autonomy is crucial to the project of inquiry. He, um, he says that the state should neither decide who will pursue the project of inquiry, nor what specific investigations will be made. You know, People who engage in the projects should make those decisions. And here, I entirely agree with Chris, but I think explaining why this is true is a difficult matter. Um, for example, Chris says, quote, it's only the agent who right now can know whether the commitment to work on his 
Raz Paper, for example, can, must, or need not take precedence over his daughter's desire to go to the park and his chair's desire to talk about next year's job searches, end quote. Well, that's not true. It's not true that the agent is the only one who can know what he should do in that kind of conflict. Tragically, we all know people who get this stuff wrong, and we know better than them what they should be doing. We know people who systematically privilege their work over their families in ways that are ultimately destructive of their well-being. Marriages break up over this stuff, and it's bad for the people whose marriages break up. And we know people who systematically privilege their minor but immediate academic obligations over their serious research in ways that are destructive of their careers. Um, I, I don't mean to use these examples to argue in favor of paternalism and intrusion into people's lives, but just to point out that whatever the right argument is against paternalism, it's not that agents always know best, so they should be left alone. Okay, finally, the claim in Chris's essay which struck me the most was his claim about the relationship between autonomy and projects such as inquiry. Chris says that Raz points out that autonomy requires the availability of a diverse menu of life projects, but Chris urges the reverse is also true. Many projects require autonomy. And this is not because when you consider the life in which you're engaged in the project and you have autonomy and the life in which you're engaged in the project and you lack autonomy, this life is better. It's not just that. It's that the project of, auton of inquiry, say, um, is more truly engaged in and more legitimately um, pursued if you have autonomy. So, as Chris says, the pursuit of a project such as inquiry becomes, in the presence of autonomy, quote, a fuller realization of that very way of life. This seems right to me. Thanks. Chris, would you like to respond? Yeah, just a, a couple of, of brief, brief comments. <clears throat> I, I really, uh, really admire the last sentence of your this seems great to me. That's excellent. Um, I don't, working backward, uh, I don't want to say that uh, the agent always, always knows best. Mm -hmm. um, and, and most of the claims that I, I make uh, should be taken as normative to some degree or other. They're not just descriptive of, of how things are. Um, but I do, think that, I do think that agents are in a better position in principle to make these sorts of decisions, whether they're decisions about, about inquiry or decisions about marriage or decisions about medical care, for instance. Uh, and even though you're right that sometimes we're in a position where, where we, we say, oh no, this, we know that this person is making the, decision, the, making the wrong decision, those cases in which we're the ones who are, who are privileged epistemically are actually typically ones in which we're very close to the person who's, who's making those sorts of decisions. So we're, with, we're already within the scope in some sense of, of the projects and commitments that, that they're engaged in. Uh, for somebody you know, at, at any kind of distance, whether physical or metaphorical, to think that they know those, you know, that they can make those sorts of judgments systematically in a better way, I think would be, would be really presumptuous. Um, so that's, that's one point about, about and this, basically there are thir three, three parts of your comments that I just want to comment briefly on. And a, a second very brief comment on that last part uh, is that while I, I do think that, uh, that decisions about inquiry, qua decisions about inquiry, right, are protected from the state. There can be various other reasons that can lead the state to, to intervene. Right? I mean, inquiry can abut against the common good in a variety of ways that it might make sense for the, the state to get involved in. But I think that's just a that's just a minor point. Um, working working back, then I wanted to say something about uh, what was the the second oh the science the science and uh, and humanities issue. I, I and I don't think anybody really has ever adequately explained what the difference is between the two of them. So I, I'm happy to be corrected in in any number of ways. But I do think it is an important fact that there's more consensus in the sciences 
and it's a, it's a fact that has consequences in terms of how we think about ethics. It, it is just a fact about the literature about science and ethics that people make a great deal about the lack of consensus in ethics in terms of what that means for uh, the status of moral truths and, and the possibility of, of moral objectivity. I, wouldn't, I, also, I would not want to deny that our hopes, fears, desires, et cetera, get involved in scientific research and probably play some explanatory role in those instances in which there are disagreements, although I think also just the difficulty of the, the subject matter can do that. But what, what I wanted to suggest is that in the case of the humanities, there's something about the fact that we're, we're, we're studying something with the tools I mean, that the tools that we're using are the same things that we're studying that can lead us to, to a sort of intensified ability to deceive ourselves or to, to lead ourselves down the garden path, whereas in at least some cases of scientific inquiry, however much we want there to be cold fusion, uh, we just are not going to be able to make it happen, even though we, we, may have think, we may think that we saw it happen, we're just not going to be able to repeat the experiment. So that's, I mean, those are just a couple of things on the, on the second part. On the first part, the question about the, about Claim three versus claim four. Uh, I want to say something more like three, but that but I want to do it in such a way that the notion of absolute priority either gets uh, well to the extent that I accept the notion of absolute priority, it gets really rethought. Right. So so you you say things like the project wins out every time. Right, as if then every time there's an opportunity for me to inquire or do something else that I might have an interest, it's got to be inquiry. Um, by contrast, here are just a, a couple of, of, of boring examples, um, boring in the sense that they're from my life and not yours, uh, but everybody I think has examples like this. Um, for, for a couple of years, I performed in a percussion and dance ensemble from 2001 to 2004. I don't remember ever asking myself, um, whether philosophy was getting in the way of my, of my drumming. But I remember asking myself that question a lot. Right? Is the drumming getting in the way of philosophy? Is the drumming getting in the way of philosophy? And sometimes I'd answer yes and sometimes I'd answer no. That didn't mean that I wasn't doing an awful lot of drumming. Right? But that order of questioning clearly indicated what it meant for the one, it, the one social form to have priority over the other. And then you know, the group eventually dissolved and it was going to be a huge hassle to continue to, to do the same sort of thing with, with other sort of people. So, so I basically haven't really done much drumming in the last couple of years. I started running instead. Um, it would be inconceivable right, to say, oh, you know, the University of South Carolina is having a budgetary crisis, so I think I'll just stop philosophy and, and go and do something else. And when I think about doing something else, right, I mean, it, it's just a, it's a, it's a hazardous thought. And I, sometimes I think, well, it would be nice to do something else and make more money. And, that I wouldn't be able to read you know, the great new books that you know, professors X, Y, and Z are, are going to put out. Now, none of those suggest that, that inquiry has absolute priority or that it wins every time or that everything else has to be instrumentally subordinated. But, and this will be my final point on this, right, at the same time, it was always true when I was drumming, and it's actually, I think, still true when, when, when I run. And every philosopher that I've talked to who has some sort of serious avocation outside of philosophy has confirmed this that although these things are not straightforwardly instrumental, instrumentally good to doing good philosophy, it, there is some way that they contribute to, to our life as philosophers. They make, they make that life itself go better right? for being able to, to do something else, sometimes in a philosophical spirit, but not necessarily. I don't have an explanation, a full explanation of why that's the case. But I think it's important, and it also shows that this relationship of priority is not going to have these negative consequences, that it's natural to think the notion of hierarchy brings with it. Yeah. Thank you. Questions from the floor? Yes. I'm not quite satisfied by the way, way you respond to Elizabeth's argument about paternalism because I think you make it too trivial. And by putting paternalism, especially in the context of state paternalism, but I think your argument as you gave it and as Ross presents it is against every form of paternalism, also the paternalism of people in your direct surroundings. And I must confess that in the field of inquiry, 
I'm often terribly paternalistic. When I have junior scholars, I tell them what to do in many respects because I think I have been there, I have much more experience, and I know better what it is. And why is that? Because I, inquiry is just an ideal-oriented project which you increasingly tend to master. And it's not only that I have my graduate students. I think I, if I would have a discussion with Jeremy, who is my senior in his career, I think he could be as paternalistic, in a sense, towards me uh, as uh, I am towards my students. So it's something which continues all your life long. So I would say precisely the arguments you give about saying an inquiry is goods-oriented, ideal-oriented, I'm in my terminology, uh, is an argument why paternalism is part of the essence of inquiry. Okay, thanks. That, that's, that's very helpful. Um, certainly, I think, and this is, I think, generally the case with, I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're going to give an account of social forms and practices, some account of the role that authority plays in those is inevitable uh, because they're because they're social they require authority uh, because they require the forms of habituation necessary in order to be able to uh, see certain things as salient in order to be able to develop certain kinds of virtues in order to be able to understand the internal structure of what you're doing and the, and the goods that you're trying to do and you're not in a position to be able to do any of those things when you first start out in doing this there has to be authority for that reason as well, right? I mean, so there's, there's several different kinds. There's coordinating authority, but then there's just this authority of expertise in this area. And I think that's, that's hugely important. Uh, and it's important not just, obviously, in inquiry, but in any significant, rich, and complex social form. But at the same time, it seems to me that what that authority is trying to do, if it's operating appropriately, is to bring, it's to make make possible a certain pursuit of whatever goods are part of that social form that wouldn't otherwise have been possible autonomously. Right? The, the, the point of teaching your students what, that, what they need to do right now, right, of pointing them in the right directions, really is to make it possible for them ev eventually to be able to see what the right directions are without somebody having to, to, to tell them. And you're right, I mean, paternalism, I, you know, paternalism in my line of work is not, I, I don't feel particularly threatened by the state at all. I feel threatened by the chair of my department, who three weeks ago told me what question he wanted me to ask at another visiting speaker's colloquium. Um, I, <laughs> I thought that was ludicrous. Uh, there is, I mean, in, in, any, in any social context, some authority is necessary, but it is necessary for that authority right, when you're you know, dealing with any of these contexts both to operate in such a way as to bring people to the, the point where they can start to see what they need to do themselves, and then to be able to step back and allow that to happen. Um, that's very interesting. I was going to ask whether there was also another line that you wanted to pursue. Um, in responding to uh, Liz's point about paternalism, that even if the senior person knows better than you do, how your time would be best structured. Still, there might be some sort of, it, it might wreak havoc for him to impose that on you yeah. um, for various reasons, because there are so many parts of your schedule that only you can control. But uh, I like this other argument no, uh, as well. I think, I mean, it's, it's I mean, the, effectively what you're saying is that there is a difference between paternalistic interference oriented to the eventual production of an of a, uh, autonomous scholar and paternalistic interference um, proceeding on the assumption that autonomy would never matter. Uh, That's right. And, and actually, I mean, one thing, one thing that I think would be, it would be interesting to pursue, though not now, and, and I hope to pursue it, is uh, what actually needs to be done, it seems to me, in order for people to be able to be genuine inquirers needs to start very, very early in life. Sure. Um, and so there are a whole host of issues relating to, to children's education within yes. which obviously a kind of paternalistic authority is essential. Sure. But those, you know, the, the justification for that is ultimately non-paternalistic. Chris, can I ask you something about liberalism? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know what? That's, uh, that's risky for me. <laughs> okay. So you said, look, suppose it is the case that all of these enterprises just considered in themselves, whether it's the 
practice of medicine or the pursuit of scientific inquiry or um, uh, the worship of God or whatever it is, they'll all go better uh, if pursued autonomously. And that's not a theory about um, people need autonomy. It's a theory about these enterprises right. need autonomy. And so the best perfectionist account of these enterprises would include autonomy. And then you say, well, you know, therefore it just muddies the water for Raz or anybody else in, uh, who accepts these arguments that you've made to add liberal to the mix, as in liberal perfectionism, according autonomy the status of a separate ideal and creating an ism, liberalism, that is dedicated to that is a mistake. And I suppose in that form it would be and I don't want to be all defensive about liberalism or anything like that. But I always understood it was it was it staked out a truth claim of exactly the form that you make that all manner of things will go better, including people and including the enterprises to which they dedicate themselves uh, if uh, they are uh, pursued autonomously and in an environment supportive of um, autonomy. And this is not put forward as a as a, uh, a hobby nor as a matter of taste. Uh, you know, we happen to like autonomy, but we know there are people who don't. It's put forward effectively as a truth claim uh, by people. I mean, J.S. Mill, I think, is the, the clearest example. Who knows whether he ever wanted to describe himself as a liberal or cared about the label. But to the extent that there is this um, way of thinking, it stakes a truth claim. Um, and it seems to me it's a truth claim that's roughly in the ballpark of what you're saying. Unless, I mean, there, was, there was a remark that you made, maybe in your response to Liz, unless you think that liberals are staking a truth claim about what's important for individuals and saying nothing about what's important for the enterprises mm -hmm. as such that they may engage in. Um, and I suppose that's possibly true of some, of some liberals, but it seems a broad enough label to comprehend, again, both and the sort of all manner of things will go uh, all manner of things will go better. To, you know, uh, government will go better. Uh, science will go better. Um, if Locke is right, then the pursuit of religion will go better. Um, it's going to end up being a question about labels, but do you have any response? It, it, well, yes. I mean, it is partly that question about labels, and, and I'm being just a little bit rhetorical at that, at that point. I, yes, definitely, I think. Uh, perfectionism and and sort of a classic form of liberal, liberalism, you know, historically classical form of liberalism, just they overlap in very, very nice ways. Um, but the, the historical trend of liberalism looks to me like it, in some respects, has followed this trend of then detaching right, autonomy and liberty from the perfectionist aspect of the theory and privileging that in one way or another way, right? right. So, but in various ways to the expense of the... Yeah, I think there's a danger of political right. liberalism, for example. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, so, and so, yes, I mean, is my, at, at the end of the day, is this a, a liberal position within, within the, the, the broad tent of liberalism? Yes, it is. Um, but but it, I, it doesn't seem to me that the label is necessary. Right? Um, and that when we have the label, it gives rise to the possibility of, of various mistaken understandings of what that ideal is all about. But, but that's, not a deep, that's not a deep answer to your, to your question. Well, the deep question. <laughs> Professor Raz had a comment about that, I think. I thought that would be an opportunity to join behind Jeremy again. Um, on, on the same passage in your talk, t two things about it. Uh, you say creating an ism, liberalism. Well, I don't know who created that ism. But if anyone did, which is possibly not the case, it happened some hundreds of years ago. So saying, saying it's, it's not necessary, you know, it reminds me, what, what is necessary? So where the chair is not necessary, we can talk always about seats with backs or something like that. What, why does it matter whether it's necessary or not necessary? Why accuse people of creating things which they haven't created? There's something which rears its so-so uh, head when 
you, one comes to this context, which, which, is not, which is not really relevant to an academic discussion. There's nothing in what you said there which impugns any truth about political morality, unless this does, that a result of your discussion is that it is a mistake to think that autonomy is a, a separate ideal. Again, you make it as if somebody accords autonomy, the status of a separate ideal. Well, I don't know of anyone who has the power to accord anything, the status of any kind of idea. But talking of autonomy, its undetachability, which, has, which is a point on which we both agree, does not in the least tend, I think, to show that it is not a separate value, <clears throat> unless you think that the following observation, all novels and all movies will be better if they have humor in them, shows that humor is not a separate virtue. So I don't think that that shows that humor is not a separate virtue, and I don't think that, it, that the undetachability of autonomy shows that autonomy is not a separate virtue. So I don't find the argument there. Okay. Um. I guess, well, I guess what I would have to, 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 to say, um, so I'll just, I'll say it and, and I can, I'll think about how I want to backtrack from it. Uh, and I guess that seems to me a weak understanding of what a separate ideal is, right? Um, if, if, if it is enough that we can see something as being valuable across a variety of contexts, right, that that something counts as a separate ideal, then I guess I have no objection to calling autonomy a separate, to saying that there's a separate, that autonomy is a separate ideal, right, on, on that interpretation. Um, to me, I, what, or what I, what, what looked to me like it was happening in these passages that I'm that I'm I'm looking at from from your book, uh, and and I, I think I mean if I if I had your article your long article there I, I think it looked to you in places like it was happening there are at least a couple of sentences where you, you seem to say something similar. It looks like it, what's look what it looks like to me is that the separate ideal is an ideal in that it's an end that the other things the other values are instrumental to that they they that our understanding of them is as to be pursued for the sake of the separate ideal. Right? Uh, now, if that's, not, if, that's not, if that's not right, right, if calling it a separate ideal simply means that it's one valuable aspect of a variety of different things, that's, that's fine. But, but it was the, it's the suggestion that, again, I, I, I just might be wrong. This might not be present in these passages. Uh, it's the suggestion that, that I thought was there that there is an order of priority between the various perfectionist goods and the good of autonomy that puts autonomy first and those goods in service of autonomy that I found problematic. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it may be very important for us to notice that something is not separate in the strong sense of worth mm -hmm. pursuing whatever else you pursue. Um, not worth pursuing in a detached sense, whatever that would possibly mean. It may be very, very important to emphasize that it's pursued as part of a package or along with other things that one pursues and so on. Um, and that might be an interesting distinction because there certainly have been people um, usually misconceived who have thought about some aspects of liberty uh, or who have said things about liberty that indicated they might think that and some who have said things about equality that indicate they might think that, and there this almost becomes incoherent uh, to think about pursuing it as a separate ideal. Packaging it in a, under the heading of a general body of political thought you know, that may have been originated, I, as I understand it, liberalism was invented by a Spaniard in the early 1900s, but 
whatever, the world, you know, liberalism, you know, uh, having it as part of a package alerts you to the fact that other things might be at stake, and in the regular liberal package, it's associated with um, certain things and not others. And one way of reading, I think, what you're saying is that that may be the wrong package to alert you to the relevant interconnections with other mm -hmm. ideals. Sure. Although that can't be an objection to liberal perfectionism, since that deliberately alerts you that the package is slightly different from what it is in non-perfectionist uh, liberalism. But, the, but the, I mean, the point that you do want to hang on to, which I think is perfectly right, is that this ideal must be understood in the context of the pursuit of other ideals and not in and of itself as something that would be worth pursuing come what may, um, I think then the packaging becomes right. important because it, it helps to key us into a heritage of thinking about relations between these different ideals. And, and maybe and here, just to go back to the, the, humor, the humor case, uh, and it seems to me that, that somebody can, so now I'm, I, now I, I think I, I want to agree that I mean, I'm going to say some things about humor. And somebody might decide to write books because, I mean, somebody, that humor might be their thing, right? They're, they're interested in being funny. And, so, and they might be skilled enough that they can be funny in a couple of different mediums. So they, they want to write books in order to be funny, and they want to you know, do stand-up in order to be funny, and to do some films in order to be funny. Right? And that is what I want to suggest is not helpful for, as a way of thinking about autonomy. Right? We don't want to pursue medicine in order to be autonomous or to, be, or, or to have the, the possibility of pursuing medicine and various other things in order to be autonomous. According autonomy, the status of separate ideal in that sense, in the sense that I think you can accord humor the status of a separate ideal, I think that that gets the package wrong. That's not the package that I want to say is, is the helpful one. I just wanted to say that I find uh, people who crack jokes all the time among the most tiresome people that they ever come across. <laughs> it's, it's almost as bad as pursuing autonomy without pursuing any other good. <laughs> Chris, I wanted to uh, put a question to you and then also ask uh, Liz to comment uh, on it from her perspective. Uh, toward the end of your paper, you uh, raised some issues about uh, the, the nature of human goods of the type uh, that you... Uh, well, some examples were friendship and uh, the pursuit of intellectual knowledge and aesthetic appreciation and so forth. About the uh, nature of those goods, and particularly about how they are uh, treated in, uh, in the morality of freedom in Joseph's uh, uh, other work, that I hadn't uh, thought about for many years, but had occasion to think about many years ago when Leora Botnitsky uh, wrote, uh, was a graduate student, and wrote a very nice paper which was published in the Oxford Journal of Legal Studies comparing Joseph's thought uh, with John Finnis's thought on the question of the nature of human goods. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad that you've raised the issue again, although you only had time for a little bit of uh, reflection on it at the end. Let me ask you to reflect a little deeper on it. Um, do you uh, take the position, is it your view, uh, you, you say that human goods of the sort we're talking about, basic forms of human good, uh, are not states of affairs. Is that to deny that they are instantiated and can only be instantiated in states of affairs? And do you take Joseph to be, de to be claiming that, in fact, they are states of affairs so that you're distinguishing your own position from Joseph's on that ground, that, that Joseph sees them as states of affairs and that's a mistake. They ought not to be viewed as states of affairs. And then you know you have reasons they're more open-ended uh, than that, and, and and so forth. So what do you, what do you say? And then Liz, I don't. I'd, I'd be just curious to hear what you have to say. I, no, I don't. I mean, I don't think that they're states of affairs. But I do think that any instantiation of them, I mean, just almost by definition, is in a state of affairs. I don't think that you think that that basic reasons are 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 states of affairs. Um, I sometimes reading. The morality of freedom. Uh, I'm a little troubled at the, the use of, of, of the word goal uh, because it, it seems that that occasionally, in our in, in common usage, does imply a state of affairs. But I don't think that I don't. I mean, I think you actually you distinguish 
your use of it from any use that would imply the, the, the thought that, that they're, you're looking at terminal states of affairs as reasons. And so, I think so, so your foil here isn't Joseph, it's, but no, it's, it's no, Dewey, it's isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. And I also think, I mean, the other thing, I mean, I think your, your emphasis on action reasons is, is very helpful in, in pushing us away from the thought that states of affairs are our ultimate reasons for action. Liz? I, I think I'll use my time to ask a question. <laughs> I, I did wonder about the emphasis on um, the really uncertain kinds of projects and goals as um, imprint, well, is not completable. I, I was wondering how, how serious that is. So it does seem like people take as their goals of their projects like um, peace on earth, um, the eradication of, of, starva of starving. Now, it's not actually going to happen. They're not completable in the sense that they won't be completed. They're not practically completable, but in principle, they're completable. And those seem like the kinds of projects that we might want to be talking about in the same breath as these others. I guess I, I, I don't really think of them as being even in principle completable. Um, and I, I guess with a particular theory of human nature, one could think that peace on earth was a, pot a potentially completable goal, but, but that's not a theory of human nature that I, that I share. Can, can uh, I interrupt? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think you're in heated agreement. Uh, I, I don't think there needs to be a difference here. Maybe there is, but you'll, you'll for, f f find a way to it. Uh, I, I think what Liz is suggesting is that you can have these things as goals, you can work toward them, and you can actually, in principle, bring about this thing, peace on earth. But that would only contradict the point you're trying to make if it were the case that once achieved, it was achieved once and for all and no further work were needed, no further deliberation and decision would be required. But so long as we're talking about, uh, if we say you know, that the harmony between people is a basic form of human good, even if we achieved it, there would be the continuing continue, enterprise right? of deliberating and choosing in such a way as to favor uh, peace on earth. Same with uh, eradication of starvation. Why do we want to eradicate starvation? Because we appreciate uh, the, the goods of life and health. We understand them as providing reasons for action of a certain type that require deeper further reasons for their intelligibility. But once we've got people fed, we've got to keep on feeding people. It wasn't as if life and health then suddenly disappear as providing reasons for action because they're no longer relevant. Does, does that make sense? So that, that seems right. It seems right that once we've no more starvation. We've still got to be careful that no starvation develops. Um, I've well, well, but not just no starvation. We've, we've got to make sure that all, all the rest of the things for the sake of which we act to, to bring about human health. We want people to exercise, and we want people to take good care of themselves, and, and, and all that. Let so there's, life and health so, remain good. Right. So there's two points there. One point is that even the, the projects that I said were completable aren't really completable because there's always more people, and you want to be take care of them too. But then also, um, perhaps a deeper worry that the projects I was talking about maybe aren't, aren't pursued for their own sake, but are pursued for, for other reasons, and then the other reasons endure and give, continue to give us projects. Um, it does seem like um, the, the, the fact that there keep being new people that need to, I mean, that does seem, it, it, like, um, they could be the same people, though. I mean, you don't need you don't need new people. Yeah, right? you be the I, same okay. people. The thing that motivated you to fight starvation, that is the the health and the preservation of the lives of these people. Even if you've beaten starvation, you know, keep getting people and keeping people healthy is just an ineradicable. Goal. I mean, you, 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 all of us has to have to have to pay attention to that throughout our entire lives. So it remains a good that can provide a reason for acting of the relevant. Of the relevant sort. I mean, is there any, is there any reason to doubt that, really? And, and it's not as if peace on earth is this instrumental goal, who that is instrumental to the goal of interpersonal harmony. I mean, it just is interpersonal harmony. It's an instantiation when it's achieved of interpersonal harmony. Yeah. Here you go. The best I can do for mankind is eradicate smallpox. There you go. Right, and and um, and it, there I am working away feverishly, and it looks like we're down to the last five cases of smallpox. And I say, "Good Lord, you know something's gone wrong. This, this is a goal in danger of, <laughs> of 
of completion. Um, it is true. It must that not any, be that valuable then. That's right. But but anybody who was committed to it would no doubt be committed to other things. But whether we would want to say that goods have this necessary feature of a limit uh, illimitability, or rather the reasons that are associated with the pursuit of goods are usually likely to have an open-ended commanding right. structure. I mean, what I want, yeah, I want to say that project. the goods the goods are the reasons, right? And and the no. person, yeah, the person who who the goods that give that that provide us intelligibility to pursuing the, the cure for smallpox. Right. So the thesis instance. is not the no projects. Right. It's right. Right. Okay. And and that person, you know, I mean, if that person is sensible, then then that person will have some larger commitment to the good of people's well-being by way of health than just that particular project. I mean, otherwise you have no reason to live after you've, after you've completed the project. And it seems to me really, really problematic. I mean, if you put, you put all your eggs in the, in the completion of your novel or in the, the satisfaction of, of your particular scientific project, um, then it, it, it actually seems to me that, that you're not genuinely committed to the, the larger scale reasons that, that underlie that. I mean, you know, why, why think that there was nothing left to do once you had satisfied those I was those thinking there might be, I mean, with certain projects, there might genuinely be a sort of a non timidus aspect to it, you know. The, the, the projects themselves, yeah. yeah. Right. But they, I, I, they, need, they need a larger framework within, within an agent's life, it seems to me. Oh, uh, yeah. Got, oh sorry. Uh, there was somebody behind oh. you, too, Alex. Um, so, Chris, I was, I was sort of curious about the last bit of your paper um, when you say that, you know, Raz's tying objectivity to intelligibility was too thin. And you say, well, we should talk about these primary goods and talk about human nature. I, I really didn't quite see why you thought that, right? Because, I mean, I, you know, as I understand Joseph's picture. It's right, right, we look across these different practices and we try and make sense of them, we can abstract from the particular practice and say, oh, well, look, right? We find all over the place people seem to care about having some kind of family life, though the social form they're realized in is different. And you want to say something like, well, there's some kind of priority to family life, right? And that's somehow an expression of human nature or something like that. I didn't quite see why one would make that move, right? That just seems to make the picture ontologically complicated, and I wasn't sure what the payoff was supposed to be from doing so. Right. No, I, I think that's actually, that's a great question. Um, it seems to me that these, these features that I want to identify of, of the, the breadth, depth, and, and incompletability of the goods do more than just make what we do intelligible Right? They do that, but they, they do it because they make it possible, right? That it's these features of the, this very limited set of goods, right? You know, it's, you know, it's a, a number under 10, however many it actually is, right? That these features of these goods are precisely what set already for us the parameters within which we can do anything, right? Anything at all that we do makes sense for us as specified already by those goods in some way or other. And if that's the case, if they, if, if they make possible right, the horizon of action for us, rather than simply making intelligible what it is that, that we have done, right, if, they, if they're the horizon for us of all possible action, that's, that can only be, it seems to me, because they represent to us in some way the possible actualizations of potentialities that are ours. Right? Now, you might take still a, mo a fairly thin reading of that as, as a, an account of what human nature is, right? Well, we have potentialities and the goods, basic primary goods or reasons point us in the direction of, of actualizations of those potentialities. But I think that's still, that's still something, right? That tells us something important about what we are as the particular kind of practical species that we are, right? We're creatures that are oriented practically towards you know, a limited set of possibilities, but our nature is such that that limited set of possibilities is infinitely open-ended in a variety of different directions. Uh, it seems to me that that's just that's an ontological claim about about what we are, uh, and that you know I, I don't think it's a major difference, but but I think that to 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 go that route and make that ontological claim is to say is to go more in the direction of of eternal verities. Right? Why why think that our nature changes? 
it doesn't seem plausible to me. Actually, that's, that's, a, that's a good tie into the question I was going to ask. When, when emphasizing the relationship between autonomy and these other projects we pursue, as you were describing it, it seems like there's at least two different sorts of motivations you might have for wanting to make that point. One would be that if we misunderstand the relationship and, and sort of make autonomy the goal uh, and these other things sort of a means to it, uh, people pursuing the goals in that way are going to do a poor job of it. You know, so in other words, the person who's at the art museum looking at the beautiful painting and fixating on how autonomous she is while doing so is doing a worse job of enjoying art than the person who's just able to enjoy the art without, uh, even, if it's, even if it's freely chosen. That would be sort of one, one reason. But then there's a second reason, which is that the more, aut the more often autonomy is what gets sort of top billing, so to speak, uh, it can sort of be used as a trump card to close off discussions about whether the good being pursued is really a worthwhile one or not, whether it's being pursued in a reasonable sort of way. Um, and it, it seems like that may also be part of, part of what your motivation is for wanting to, to invert it because, uh, you know, following your response to the last question, if the, the number of goods we can pursue in a reasonable way is a limited set, it seems to me the upshot of your your focus of not having autonomy be the first question is to try to make those other things the first question and, and, and force more of the, our attention to be concentrated on those. Is that, is yeah, that right? No, I mean, that's right. That is, that is what I, I mean, the question of directionality of these, two, of these two notions, the perfectionist, the cluster of notions and the autonomy notion in my paper, right, is to, is to make the perfectionist clutch the cluster of notions, the primary object of practical deliberations and considerations, right? And you want to get, yes, I think you're right, you want to get those right. And I mean, there's at least, there's at least a worry, there's at least a danger, I think, in the focus, in, in getting the focus reversed, that uh, it will be adequate for somebody, right, for them to, to think that they've, that they've been successful in action by way of having been autonomous. Right? And I don't think that's I don't think that's adequate at all. Uh, yes. Yes, Warren. Um, thank you. Um, this might this question might just be that I haven't quite got something that happened already. So if it is, I'm sorry. Um, I'm wondering about what the criteria are for how you would tell whether something counts as a primary goal, um, because it seems like just if you take the examples that that have been used so far. Um, you, I was interested in your response to the question that you wanted to push more toward three and away from four, something that looks more normatively rich, uh, in the sense that one kind of claim it seems like could be made is just to say of a person that if there isn't a kind of integration among the purposes that one has, that that will make for a poor display of agency. Um, but another claim is that what you should really do is among different kinds of ways of being an agent is to take the, uh, the, the primary goal uh, among and have the hierarchical thing. Um, but it seems like in the examples that lives that we would think of as being morally laudatory, things that we would praise in lives, are not the kinds of things that require deep participation in any social form. We can do things for other people, we can be focused outwardly in ways that are uh, that look like they're good for others more than concerned for ourselves, and we can do these things without really becoming excellent in any particular capacity. And that the other examples, the ones that are primary goals that are self-directed are those where we're less, we're less concerned with other people. But it seems like it would be you know, a completely good description of a life to say that a person was always doing the moral thing, doing supererogatory moral actions. So if you were to say that that counts as a primary goal, then it looks like it's, just to, to follow up on the, the prior example, like the marriage case, where it looks like there's just this broader family. We expand the idea of what a primary goal is to include different kinds of things. It's just a genre of goals. But if you say that that's excluded, then it, would it be the case that that doesn't count so much as a good life, a life toward which we would want to direct ourselves? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think so. Um, and I think that, first of all, I guess I, I would find it difficult to conceive of a life that I thought was particularly successful uh, along an axis of altruism right? that was, as it were, just what, what the bumper sticker, random acts of kindness and charity or what have you. I mean, a, a life that was oriented towards others but unstructured by 
some significant social form. Right? So that uh, one of the ways, obviously, in which lives become deeply structured towards aid to other peoples is through a religious commitment. Right? Others, another way is by way of commitment to some particular form of you know, fairly structured social action for a cause, for instance, right? So that you're you're not just doing good things, you know, across a variety of different contexts, but you're doing good things of a particular sort with other people who are pretty much in line with you as regards the importance of this particular kind of pursuit. It seems to me that that, that is both more successful with respect to other the people who are being served and with regard and and more successful as regards the shape of your life. Right, than, than it would be if you were just pursuing it individualistically or in a way that was not well integrated into the, the overall pattern of your life. Now, what I want to say is, going, going back to the beginning of your, of your question, is that the goods, how do we identify the goods? Well, I mean, we identify them in, in, our, in our practical thought, but, but what can give us indications that we're on the right trail. It seems to me that, again, these notions of, of breadth and depth are, are very important, right? I mean, a friend of mine thinks that it's just a basic good, that, that, that sensory pleasures are a basic good. So when you, his example is you stop into the coffee shop and you smell, and then you walk on, right? It's a basic good just to smell the coffee, right? But it's clearly a good that, if it is a good, has no breadth and no depth, right? You can't systematically pursue this in deeper and deeper ways. It seems to me that the, the basic goods are the ones that precisely provide the opportunities for us through the development of social forms and commitments to be able, together with other people, to do that. And because those goods are not just goods for me or goods for you, but goods for all of us, the social forms that are available to us in pursuit of those are deeply, I mean, they're social. They're, they're socially oriented. And so in structuring our own life and being able to provide, to provide form and constitution to the shape of our own life, Right? We are also enabled to be able to benefit other people along the axes of those goods that these particular social forms have structured. And it seems to me that's very important right, for us to be successful. Uh, I think I want to disagree with it. Um, uh, I've been working on a project on ideals and idealism for 10 years with a large group of researchers. And so many of those discussions sound very familiar uh, this afternoon. Um, but one of the thesis uh, we uh, came up at some point is that you have a decreasing utility of commitments to a certain life, form of life, or project, or whatever. And I can give you a quite clear example. The past four years I've been president of a church, and many said, why don't you continue working on this? And I said, no, I can feel that if I continue to do this for many more years, my utility will be decreasing, and you'll be fed up with me, and so on. And I think many of the projects, uh, you seem to have the presupposition that it's good to have one core project to continue with that for a long time. I think many of our valuable projects, many of our valuable commitments, are even better served by switching them, and now going into politics for whatever, of going into <laughs> No, whatever kind of important forms of life. So I think you need to reconsider under what circumstances it is valuable to continue with working on a project or a form of life and under what circumstances it's better. Uh, take the example of marriage. Uh, you have one model in which the best goal of marriage is to be with one partner for the rest of your life. But it's equally defensible that at certain points some partners grow apart and it's better for them to separate and get in with a new project to evolve themselves in a new project. So I don't think you can have a priori arguments whether one or the other argument is better. No, that's, that's, I mean, your point is well taken. Uh, and certainly various social practices have, they have internal to them different degrees of both possibility and rigidity with respect to what they expect. So the practice of being a musician, right? And one could do that for one's, I mean, that could, that could structure, that could potentially structure a very large part of one's life, right? One could see oneself primarily as a musician, and that would have various consequences for a variety of decisions that one would make. But 
the notion of being a musician doesn't bring with it the necessity of that kind of a commitment, right? It, it says, well, that's, that's possible, but, but one could also be a musician to some lesser extent. The practice of being a doctor is obviously not like that, right? You can't be a doctor for 10 years and then say, well, now I'm going to do better if I go and, and do something else without, in some sense, ceasing to be a doctor. The, the, the commitment to being a doctor is, as understood from within that particular practice, seems to me much more uh, richly specified as to what you need to do in order to genuinely be part of that part of that practice. Uh, the notion of marriage, I think, right, actually brings with it a much more robust commitment. Right, um, I think one in fact. I mean, if you as comparing the the practice of marriage and the and and almost any of the other professions, right, it would be insane to have a profession that said. Uh, when there's a conflict between, you know, when your wife is, is sick, for instance, or your spouse is sick and, and you need to care for your spouse, right, um, but you've got an important legal brief that you need to do or you've got, you know, important work that you've got to do in your medical practice or et cetera, et cetera, your profession takes precedence. I think there's actually something a bit insane about that, right? But is there any guarantee that in the social world in which we live, those normative expectations will have been well worked out either in one individual's mind or in a society's mind. No, and this, I mean, I thought Liz's point was, was, was very well made about academics, and you could also then add business people, and you could add doctors. I mean, the professions are particularly prone to this, right? The, the tension that comes between work and family is not well negotiated by individuals, and part of the reason it's not negotiated well by individuals is that the professions themselves, I think, have not given adequate thought to what their normative relationship is to other parts of people's lives. And because that's a normative question, it's not going to be just settled by, by you know, conceptual analysis of the nature of the particular pr profession or by fiat, by somebody. In, I mean, it, it actually requires normative thought. What is the relationship between being married and being an academic or being married and being a business person? Okay, well, thank you uh, uh, very much, Chris and Elizabeth and uh, Tamsin. Uh, could I suggest that instead of having the full 10-minute break that we had, <laughs> had planned, if it's not too onerous uh, for people, if we could cut that to a five-minute break uh, just to maximize the amount of time we have with Joseph before uh, we have to uh, end, for the, uh, end for the day and to make sure that we do have some time for discussion after his remarks. So uh, let's uh, take five minutes. But thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you.